and welcome to the first edition of Veganic Gardeners Question Time. I'm Dan Graham and I'll be your host for this evening. Um, for those that are new to Veganic Gardening, Veganic is a combination of two words, vegan and organic. It's a guarantee that your food has been grown organically with only plant-based fertilizers, which encourage biodiversity. So we don't use any uh, pesticides, uh, agricultural chemicals, no GMOs. Uh, we don't use any animal inputs such as fish, blood, bone, or manure. Veganic, it's green, clean, and good for the planet. It seems in these strange times, there's been a boom in amateur gardening. People seeking solace in the gardens, allotments, and daily walks. It's not, only, it's not only vegans that are interested in having food grown cruelty free, but more and more people are making the link between, eat, uh, between deadly viruses and eating and farming animals. We all want safe food that's grown in a way that's good for the planet. And the best way to guarantee how your food is grown is to grow it yourself. Today's show is brought to you by the Vegan Organic Network, an educational charity founded in 1996, the only UK organisation solely dedicated to veganic farming and growing. In today's show, we hope to bring you some new ideas and inspiration, however big your garden or windowsill may be, we're here to help you grow. We've had a bundle of questions sent in already. Uh, and if you have a question, please type it into the chat and we'll endeavour to answer it before the end of the show. So without further ado, I guess it's time to introduce the panel. We can see one of our panelists there already. People, if the panelists would like to, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. So we can see you all now. We've got Matthew, Joe, Piers, and Ellen. Well, hey. Hello. So we've got Matthew uh, Appleby. He's a writer, journalist, three times winner of the Garden Guild Media Best Journalist Award. Really? Hi, Matthew. How are you doing? Hello. How are you doing, Dan? Great, great. So you're in, is it Wimbledon where you are? I am, yeah. Rainy Wimbledon. Rainy Wimbledon. <laughs> the, the, the suntan you've got doesn't look make it look like it's been rainy. Have you, have you been out in your allotment a lot? Mostly in the allotment, avoiding work. <laughs> great. Uh, are you growing some good things at the moment? Uh, yeah, lots of things. It's been great, actually, this spring. I had plenty of time to do it because everyone's at home, obviously. So, yeah, great. Magic. All right. Well, we'll be talking to Matthew a bit later. And we've got uh, Joe Kidd. Joe Kidd, um, community activist, uh, organiser, co-founder of uh, Vegan Organic Kent, a uh, off-grid, veganic um, agroforestry project, which, which is working to benefit humans, animals and the earth. A brilliant project. Well, how are you doing, Joe? Hiya, Dan. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to be here. Brilliant. Well, it's a great project you've got, Joe. Can you, can you enlighten us all a little bit about it? It's a pretty unusual project. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, as you know, we're not, we're not pioneers in, 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 so, in so many ways. Other people have had veganic farms, but we, we are a, a farm, if you like, um, a veganic agroforestry farm in um, East Kent near Faversham. And we're farming on 5.6 hectares, so um, pretty small, but big enough for us. And when I say we, that's um, myself and my, my partner, comrade or Terry, depending on who you are, what you want to call him, and, uh, and our daughter Rosa, and lots of other people helping and advising. Um, uh, big shout out to Pavon, who's staying with us at the moment. He's from Bangladesh. So, but yeah, a real community kind of collaborative project. Um, and we, yeah, as I say, 100% agroforestry. So we've got about an acre and a half of food forest. And then the rest of it is alley cropping. So we've just, um, well, this year we've planted 2,000 crop trees, um, including and shelter belt trees, and um, short rotation coppice willow as well. And last year we planted uh, woodland and um, and hedgerows. So we've got another 3,000 trees to plant. So um, gradually, gradually getting there. We've only been on the land two years. So um, and as you said, we, we're we're off grid, and um, we were kind of doing this. You know, we had other projects going on, so the, the kind of lockdown has been, as Matthew said, you know, useful for us in, in lots of ways. Um, 
we've been able to just get on with things. So uh, yeah, we just planted, we just sown um, some heritage wheat and some oats. And um, that's just kind of like transition period really until we get more of the, more of the perennials online. So uh, yeah, cool. We just, we just got news that we had an organic status recently. So we'll be going for the veganic, the all important veganic status next. Brilliant, brilliant. And can you tell us a little bit about the veganic bread that you've been making? Well, yeah, we haven't made it. We we so last year we sowed um, a heritage variety, April bearded red wheat, um, for a local sourdough baker, an artisan vegan, you know, vegan, totally vegan sourdough baker, um, who's literally a mile and a half down the road from us. So um, yeah, so kind of carbon carbon neutral or carbon negative bread really because uh, <clears throat> we use electric vehicles and, and they use electric vehicles and uh, obviously it was planted in alleys so um, yeah so all good and we'll be pl we've planted some more, uh, sown some more of that so we'll have uh, more of that to sell this year and we'll just see how it goes really but yeah they made a, a heritage loaf from it which is delicious. Great well I hope to taste that sometime in the future well I think <laughs> Joe's leading the way so also on the panel, we've got Piers Warren, who's a uh, writer of several books, and he's the <laughs> founder and principal of Wild Eye, the international filmmaking school. Um, and also he's the co-author. Oh, I forgot. I'll, I'll get the books out later on, but I just realised <laughs> I was supposed to advertise the books at the beginning. He's the co-author of The Vegan Cook and Gardener. Um, so we'll be showing you Matthew and Piers's book later. Oh, he's got, he's got a copy there. Um, so how's things going with you, Piers? Yeah, good, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm based in Pembrokeshire, right by the coast. So it's very mild here. We very rarely get a, a frost. And I grow in my garden here and also have an allotment nearby. So I'll be talking from the viewpoint of growing veganically on a small scale, so garden and allotment for a small family rather than on a, a larger scale. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I did look up where, it's Broadhaven where Piers lives and it's a idyllic little village by the seaside, <laughs> the good place to retreat to. And we've got um, Ellen Mary, um, world traveller, travels the world, telling people about the benefits of nature and gardening. She's a uh, horticultural radio and TV presenter and we're lucky enough to have her co-hosting today. Hi Ellen, how you doing? <laughs> that, that makes so much pressure this way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I actually live in uh, Norwich in Norfolk but I'm stuck in America right now and I can't get back due to the pandemic. So I'm currently in North Carolina. Usually I garden uh, veganically in, uh, in, on my allotment plot and in the garden. Um, and I have quite a lot of experience of uh, working in a city. So at the moment I'm trying to spread the word here in North Carolina, but it's, um, it's a, that's a tough one. Great, great. Okay, so are we, uh, is all the panel and Ellen ready for the first question? Are we going to field the first question out there? And I think if, uh, if I can find Jake, we'll get him to do the second question. So if you've got, do you want to read out the first question, Ellen? And if people want to type sure. questions in, I'm not quite sure where the chat goes, but oh, there's a Q&A button here. Yeah. Oh, no so, questions um, yet. Okay. We've, okay. got ten, we've got 10 questions given to us already, which I'll read out in order of when they came in. Um, so we've really probably only got about three or four minutes to answer each question. So I think everyone will try to, um, you know, focus on giving as much information as they can during that time. But if you see me frantically waving, it's to say, stop, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the first question is from Howard. He says, I garden what I think would refer to as no dig organic. I don't use artificial fertilizer or any pesticides and herbicides. I have a friend who keeps two very old horses and I have access to the manure heap. What harm is the use of this manure doing to, doing to me and the environment? I'm not sure what wormer or medicines she uses for the horses, but when I examine the heap, it's full of life, worms and invertebrates. 
I compost the manure further at home and mix it with my garden compost before using it on my garden. So the question is, what harm is this doing? So yeah, who was going to take this question up <laughs> first? I'm happy to kick off if you like. Hey. Just... Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, hi Howard, thanks for your question. Um, I think you've kind of partially answered it really with um, when you said something at the end about I'm not sure what medicine that she gives the horses. I think that's obviously um, part of the issue with the manure. We won't, wouldn't know what, um, you know, was, uh, what chemicals were, were kind of going on to our food. Um, but apart from that, I think, you know, assuming that the horses are rescued, you know, that they haven't been bred, they haven't been broken in, all those, you know, all those things that um, that happen to horses when they're treated as commodities. Um, you know, they're not ridden, so they've um, got plenty of space. Um, even even taking that, all those things into account, you know, they're, they're still not self-determined, they're still enslaved, if you like. So, um, you know, the whole point of, also, also I, I guess it kind of encourages and perpetuates the the view that keeping if, if you like that you know th that's the word exactly keeping animals um as pets is okay is um is uh, beneficial it's you know and, and we don't believe it is um but the whole point of organic farming you know not using manure and, and um byproducts from the cows and animal products all is that that you're cutting out the Person, you know, all, all, um, all nutrients in, um, from plants. So I still hear my internet action is on. So it, everything comes from plants. So cut out the, the middle person and just uh, use the, you know, the plant organic matter is what I would suggest. Other people might have some other things to add to that. Well, can I just chip yeah. in there for, um, for it, yeah i mean manure is you know i'd say you know i wouldn't tell anybody to not use horse manure but obviously a, a vegan gardener wouldn't but uh chances are it's got herbicides in from the grass it eats which might do your plants more harm than good um and we've all um learned a lot more about zoonoses like recently zoonotic diseases that pass from animals to to humans you know, and there is a possibility that you could get those passed through manures. So I think that is something to bear in mind with um, coronavirus. That's brought that into to sharp focus. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So I hope that helps, Howard, just explain, you know, the, what, the what's and whys. Um, so our second question is um, from Jake. And I believe Jake is going to be invited to pop up on the screen and say hello and introduce himself and ask his question live. Oh, yes. Am I right? Uh, oh, well, I, I am here. Am I there? So I'm you, are you are here. here. I we can see you. <laughs> we can see you. Nice Welcome. See you Thank you for putting the event on. It's uh, much appreciated. Go with your question. Let's hit, let's hear. Um, can the panel give any advice on the best way to start perennial vegetables, uh, growing perennial vegetables? Um, yeah, because I've uh, started a forest garden in West Wales, in uh, Ceredigion, and uh, yeah, I just really want to transition away from using annual vegetables to perennial vegetables for the resilience and uh, the ease to look after as well. And uh, they don't get eaten by slugs and snails so much, in my experience. <laughs> So, yeah, okay. Be great to hear. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Jake. Does um, who would like to take this one up first? I can start. You know, I can go. Go for it, Matthew. Yeah, hands um, up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, down down my allotment. My, you know, the easiest way to uh, to keep things going year on year is to have perennials in. So rhubarb, artichoke, uh, two types of artichoke, Jerusalem and globe. Uh, asparagus um they are they're all in there and they're they're all coming up again now year on year and you don't have to do anything at all so just get the crowns and stick them in also i'm really keen on self-seeding um vegetables like so my allotment at the moment is covered in parsnips which self-seeded from last year which is even lazier 
I love a bit of lazy gardening, by the way, so this is all good. <laughs> also, there's the perennial broccoli, which is, uh, they're quite heavy feeders, but they're pretty amazing. Um, the sprouting broccoli is sort of, is white-ish, I think, but that's really good. Um, and obviously then there's other things like rhubarb and such like, but the self-seeding, that's, that's totally brilliant. Um, okay, Pierce, you'd like to add something into that as well? Yes, just that my most uh, recent experience of perennial vegetables is tree cabbage, which I've um, planted here, both in the garden and at the allotment. And they pretty quickly grew to over a metre tall. And I grew these from seed uh, that was given to me at the uh, uh, festival I went to last year. And um, they've been very successful because you can just, just pick leaves off them as you want and use it like cabbage. Uh, but also early this spring, they produce um, lots of flowers, uh, uh, which we treated just like broccoli shoots really. So they were good to eat. And some of them we've actually now left to flower. They have little yellow flowers, typical of brassicas, and they've been attracting loads and loads of bees. Um, so we're already really pleased with, uh, with that crop. So if you can get a hold of tree cabbage, seeds and I'm in West Wales as well so maybe good for Jake then definitely give that a go. That's great so has that helped Jake? Yeah that's great yep just some some pointers has anyone had any success with uh, using growing a ground cover like a perennial ground cover rather than having to keep on putting compost on I'm just kind of curious as to you know when you're growing like tree cabbage do you just grow it straight in an ordinary bed or can you grow it in a in a in a in an ornamental bed with ground cover on them. Okay, cool. I think Joe would like to add to that. Not, yeah, not necessarily about the ground cover, but I, I think, um, hi Jake, I think you, you probably could be a future panelist from looking at your website and what you're, you know, what you're involved with, designing um, food forests. I think that's, you know, forest gardens, is that right? It is, yeah, but I find it very hard. Yeah. It's the transition to perennial vegetables. I'm finding, you know, it's just tricky and there's not much information out there. So just, yeah, it's nice to hear from okay, other people's cool. experiences. Yeah, so I guess, so I guess you know about um, Martin Crawford and the Agri Agroforestry Research Trust and, you know, his books. You, yeah. Have you got any of his books? Yeah, so they're creating a forest garden and, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's loads and loads of information there. And if I think you said you're Wales, aren't you? So you're a little bit away from where he is, but lots of, um, you know, of, of, um, food forest, forest gardens. You can go and have a tour with him and, um, you know, courses and things that he puts on. Um, and also Graham Burnett, you probably, you probably know, um, veganic permaculturist, who's written lots of books as well. And he's got a really good... Um, a, just a pamphlet really a small book about for oh actually I've got it here look forest gardening I brought it along with me is that does that look back to front yeah. <laughs> oh, <all good. laughs> yeah so there's you know there's so much information there but it's all it's all about the trees that's that's the thing that's all I wanted to say really get the trees in first you know it's they're kind of the different layers in forest gardening but the trees are the exciting bit and then work from there that's ace thank you so much we have to move on to the next question otherwise we will run out of time but i hope that's helped jake very much so um okay so our third question is from jane jane says in this time of avoiding waste i need to know how to make the stones seeds of avocado pawpaw mango etc uh, to encourage them to make shoots um, and whether the plants if successful should be treated as indoors or outdoor plants who would like to take that one up? Go on, Piers. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going, no. <laughs> <Piers>. <laughs> okay, well, these, um, in particular, these, these three plants and many other similar ones are, are of course, tropical-based uh, plants. So it is very difficult to get them to flourish and fruit in this climate when grown outdoors. Having said that, we do actually have uh, an avocado plant here out in the garden. It's over a metre tall. It's a very attractive plant, uh, but it only thrives here because we hardly ever have a frost. It's very mild here. And this particular plant is also protected by a, a hedge, which is a good windbreak. So that is thriving, but I certainly wouldn't expect it to fruit here. And in any case, um, plants like avocado 
they're, they're big plants. I mean, they can grow to 20 meters tall in the tropics, and it could be 10 years before they even start to uh, fruit. So really with those three, mango, avocado, and pawpaw, or papaya as it's also known, um, they need to be, if, if you want them to fruit, they would really need to be in a heated greenhouse or a conservatory. And of course, you'd have to prune them to keep them to a manageable size. If you are planting avocado from seed or, or the stone, remember to plant it with the pointed end upwards. And um, there are various ways of doing it. You can, you can sit it in a dish of water or you can, you can just plant it in soil uh, in all three cases. Um, so yeah, just bear in mind, they need lots of sun, lots of heat if you do want them to fruit. And out of the three, the one that will be the, probably the easiest and the fastest growing is the pawpaw, uh, which is a, a, a quick growing plant. Bear in mind, they all make uh, fabulous foliage plants. So it's maybe worth having them in the house or conservatory just as lovely plants to have. Yeah, uh, Matthew. Yeah, thanks for that, Piers, because that's helpful because it's classic kids gardening project is the avocado stone with the cocktail sticks in dangling over the water. And I wrote a book about kids gardening once and included that as a chapter, but I've got to admit, I've never made it work. So um, thanks for your tips. Yeah, it's, it's really good. I've actually seen quite a few things on social media recently where people have, have actually tried to get the avocados to grow. And it is really good fun watching them sprout. But I don't think any, as you said, are likely to fruit here at all. Although someone has just uh, kindly put into the chat at the, at the bottom um, of the Zoom webinar saying that if you don't want to waste avocado stones, you can try this. And there is actually a recipe for using avocado stones there as well. So that's something to look at too. Uh, okay, so my next question is from Paul. Paul says, for the novice gardener, starting a new raised bed to grow small variety of greens and vegetables, what's the simplest and most cost-effective way to build a veganic base of soil? Uh, his raised beds are four by eight by 12, needs to fill it with about 30 cubic feet of veganic soil. Um, the only provider of volume soil locally has added organic fertilizer to their soil mix, which includes blood and bone meal inputs. Could we please provide a basic recipe on how new gardeners can mix our own soil? Who's ready to take that one up? Matthew is. Yay, he's, I'm he's I'm right. Okay, I was, just in, I was just going to chip in at the end because on a smaller scale, I think um, a lot of people really struggle with um, finding vegan compost if they're growing window boxes or in small, small scale in a back garden or even on the allotment. So I had a big mission last year to get some products on the market because I write about the gardening industry and now you can get quite a few um, vegan composts. There's always been... Um, one or two around fertile fiber in particular but since then um happy happy compost which is board pneumonia melcor and dalefoot have all launched bags of 60 liter bags of, of vegan compost now obviously that isn't ideal for this questioner but it is ideal for a small scale gardener yeah, and also I've seen um, more recently some new mulches um, as well that are available from Natural Grower and Plant Grow that are veganic yeah. as well. And Natural Grower, I think, has been has the veganic stamp too, I believe, or Plant Grow, one or the other. Yeah. So that's also really useful. So I think there's more coming out onto the market. Definitely, yeah. Joe, Just to say, yeah, grow, grow, build your own, basically, grow your own. Um, if you can get hold of wood chip um we're big fans of wood chip we've got lots and lots of we've got access to our own wood chip but we've also been given lots in the past um and there's a good facebook group um set up by ben raskin from the soil association called i think it's called something like wood chip for soil health um but yeah if you can get you know wood chip and, and then green cuttings um obviously isn't going to be instantly ready but um yeah build your own and uh, have you know in your compost pile Gardening is a test of patience, eh? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you. Our fifth question is from Eva. 
And Eva says, my question is about how to do the sowing in a no-till vegetable garden. She lives in northern Sweden with a snow cover until mid-May. She keeps all of the wild plants, the so-called weeds, as cover crops to support the soil to regenerate and reinvigorate. Um, a big part of the garden is cultivated in raised beds, so machinery equipment to make furrows won't work. We have to do most of the work manually. We'd like to sow different kinds of kale and Swedish turnip, which have very small seeds. Earlier years, we've been growing seedlings, but we would prefer to sow direct into the soil. I'll be grateful for some advice or any good ideas on how to do the sowing practically. There we go. Anyone like to take that question up? I'm happy to start. Okay, go for it. Um, only a, just a quick, a, you know, quick one really. Why, why not um, move to perennial? So, um, so you don't need to be sowing. So look at look at some perennial um, kale. There's you know the Dorbenton's kale. I don't know about um, in Sweden, but there's Dorbenton's kale you can get hold of here. Taunton Dean kale. Um, there's also some some varieties perennial turnip um, and other root vegetable I was just looking looking up earlier actually there's one called prairie turnip other people on the panel might know about this already but timstula which was um, grown by native uh, indigenous Americans so I'm sure you know I just think that's you know probably the way to go um, I'm sure that would work just as well in Sweden as it as it does here so you don't have to be sowing every year hope that okay. helps thank you thanks Joe um, Piers uh, yes, I was just going to add that uh, because she has snow cover right until May, uh, of course, there are going to be a lot of seeds that we tend to start early that, that would be a bit late to start putting them in after the snow's gone. And increasingly, I find that I'm uh, starting off my plants indoors in pots or modules or trays and uh, then putting them out at the last minute um, before, they, before they outgrow their container. And apart from the seeds which really don't like being transplanted, that's, that's working really well. So hopefully she's got either a conservatory or a greenhouse or a space where she can do that. Yeah, I guess we all, we all have to kind of adapt to where we're gardening, don't we? And work with the weather and work with what, what we've got and, and the conditions and climatic conditions and soils. So, okay, that's great. Thank you. So number six is from Nico. Uh, this is a common question that I'm always asked. I'm sure you guys are as well. How not to kill snails, but save salad on my vegetable garden from Nico. I know they like beer, uh, but traps and alcohol are going to kill them. It must be related to water. Too much water usually used on garden, then they prosper on water. Pierce, go for that. Uh, well, yes, and I see also somebody in the uh, the chat has just asked about snails and slugs just now as well. So a uh, very common problem, as you say, and there are, if you look online, you'll find many, many different methods, especially around barriers to try and stop them getting to your plants in the first place. Um, anything from soot or coffee grounds or gravel or uh, copper bands and some of these work for some people and and not for others um, the on, on a small scale as I say I'm just talking about here as a gardener with a private garden the thing that's worked most for me is relocating so the way I do this is on an evening uh, when it's just got dark, preferably after there's been some rain during the day, that's when they all tend to come out. So I go around with a, with a head torch, a container with a lid, and I just literally pick off all the, uh, the snails and slugs that I find, put them in the container, and then release them elsewhere. One key thing is that they are homing animals. So they will try and come back to their home. It's no good just lobbing them over the fence into next door's garden because the next day they'll just come straight back again. Experiments have shown that the ideal distance is at least 100 metres. So either that night or the next day, find somewhere 100 metres away. Ideally not somebody's garden, but um, a hedge or a park or somewhere, like, somewhere wild like that where you can then uh, release them. Uh, one other tip is that uh, picking up snails, of course, is easy because you just grab the shell, but 
slug slime is particularly uh, difficult to get off your fingers afterwards. So I've just got a, a, a pair of plastic tweezers that I use to pick the slugs up and pop them in the pot. That's the nighttime gathering. The other thing you can do is during the daytime is find out where the snail's day roosts are. And they'll often be, for example, if you've got a pile of old clay pots sitting in a corner, that's the sort of place that they'll go and hide during the day. And if, if you find them, they tend to congregate. So you might find loads of them in one space. It's really easy to collect them then and relocate them. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Relocate your snails. Joe. <laughs> Just yeah, my my the, the favourite tip I have for for um, slugs and snails was from John Dale, organic grower John Dale, who lots of people will know as well. And you might be listening, so hi. But he said just just um, leave the lower leaves basically. The slugs and snails want to eat the lower leaves. It's easier. Don't be too tidy. So let them have their fair share. Eat the lower leaves, and they won't go for the for the rest. He's done that on his allotment, and it works. And um, so far, I've been doing that on our raised bed here we haven't got any other salad veg yet so um and it's worked it's fine they have their little bit and we have the rest so fair shares like poem share and share and share alike matthew exactly <laughs> um yeah piers and joe I, I i think their uh advice is brilliant there and joe obviously growing on a fairly commercial scale it's very important to sort these things out but for me just growing for fun um, being the contrarian that I am, I tend to give advice is that um, just let them eat your crops um, because I'd rather they ate my crops than I killed them. And that and that is the statement. Right. There you go. <laughs> it's so true. Um, just like super, I, we're actually going to talk about no dig as the next question, but um, my allotment's no dig. I don't know what you guys do, but I can honestly say that by genuinely creating that really nice biodiverse um, environment and having no dig that has completely and utterly helped with the snail population and I don't do anything if there's a snail there having a munch then I let it munch it's not out of control but then again like Joe I'm not you know growing on a commercial basis this is just purely on my allotment and garden but I think that there is harmony to be had and there is balance to be had there um, and it's taken a couple of years to get to that point but it, it's working so um, so that's just moving on to number seven then uh, Richard is actually asking is keen to take a no dig approach on a community allotment apart from needing lots of cardboard and compost to cover it with have you any tips for no dig novices so uh, does anyone want to pick this one up uh, or I'm happy to. <laughs> so having just mentioned I do need to, I'm so excited about the whole no, no dig thing. Um, I decided when I took my, allot, my new allotment on a couple of years ago, because I have to travel quite a lot, that it was super difficult to uh, be able, I, I just was reading all about no dig and I thought this is going to be a really good way that I'm going to be able to manage it. And um, it was, it's a, a plot in the city. It was covered in weeds, just as many allotments are when they are taken over. Lots of perennial weeds. And I was told by Charles Dowding and Steph Hafferty to not remove any of those re weeds, cover them all with cardboard, and then a really thick layer of mulch compost, garden compost if possible. But I actually got some um, veganic um, from uh, Plant Grow In. So I was very lucky to be able to do that. And I can honestly say I had, I wasn't um, sure that this was going to work. Uh, I was a bit nervous about the whole situation, so much so that I did in the end dig up uh, some of the really heavy uh, perennial weeds, such as the cooch grass and docks. And then I left all of the rest. I did put two layers of cardboard down and then a really thick layer of mulch. And I have honestly never looked back. And even in the first year, everything grew really, really well. Um, I think the most important thing for you going forward will be your composting. You must compost, you're gonna need lots of compost and you need that to be you know, organic in order to do that. Um, if no dig on a large scale is probably much harder perhaps to manage, I don't know. But to me, it's all about composting. It's all about being able to add more compost on um, at two points of the year, spring and autumn. But really all you will need to get going is cardboard and and com and veganic compost that's it and i if you're on a small scale i cannot um recommend it enough definitely 
Jo? Just to say, yeah, I agree with you totally there, Ellen, but we're, we're on a, not a big scale, but a larger scale, and our aim is to be no dig as well. Um, we're, and, you know, no, we're no plough already. We're doing some arable, but that's kind of a, a not a stop gap, but, you know, and transition. And, and the rest is, is trees, is, is tree crops, you know, fruit and nuts um, and uh, food forest. And then the plan is to just gradually, slowly add more and more perennials in between the trees in the alleys. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll not be ploughing and we're not not ploughing already but we'll not be tilling either in the future um, and we also don't use plastic so as I mentioned at the beginning lots of people have helped on the farm and you know we've got lots of um, good friends and come and help so we have done cardboard <laughs> even though we're a lot you know larger all, all around each of those well not <laughs> each of those but about a thousand of the trees there's cardboard and, and mulch wood chip and uh, yeah and grass mulch so it takes a little bit longer but you know we think it's worth it to to avoid all that horrible plastic black plastic mulching yeah that's that's actually amazing like that's proving that you can do it on a large scale basis as well my experience is only small scale and it is just cardboard and it is just mulch I don't use any plastic coverage or anything else whatsoever and like I said I was totally nervous about it but it's it's, it's totally doable I'm stuck here at the moment in North Carolina and my friends are sending me photographs of the allotment and it's still in really really good shape and everything's kind of coming to life again so I, I, I do um, it, it, it is good. There's loads of different ways of gardening, of course, but no dig being one, and, and I am quite enjoying that. So, um, Matthew? Um, I don't know how it fits in with no dig, um, but my most useful tool is the hoe. So I just hoe everything, which isn't digging, so that's all right, isn't it? Oh, yeah, a hoe, totally. Yeah. That's my number one tool. <laughs> so any seeds that have just self-seeded, you know, they're just annuals on the surface and hoeing's completely fine. Yeah, it's just literally not digging up the soil. And I think, um, I'm, like, I've only been doing it for now a couple of years, but I, I have seen increased biodiversity. The soil is great soil. You know, potatoes are growing wonderfully well, larger, bigger crops. And it is allowing nature to do its thing. So it is trying to create that kind of harmonious relationship with, you know, everything that can enjoy your outside space. But yeah, so going back to the question, cardboard and mulch. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and a hoe. <laughs> okay, so um, question eight is from Liz. I'm new to veganism and also new to gardening. Um, so I really want to know everything, but here's a few questions. My partner is saving coffee grounds for me, as I've heard these are good for the garden. Do you just mix them in with the soil? Shall we go for that question first? Who would like to answer that? Coffee grounds, what do you do with them? I'll go Pierce, yeah, let Pierce do that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, yes, you, you, you can just uh, mix it into the soil. You can um, just spread very small around, uh, amounts of it around the plants you particularly want to feed. I've also some people seen some people mix it with uh, wood ash from a wood fire or a wood burning stove and then spread that mixture around the plants as well. Okay, Matthew? Um, yeah, I think they do need mixing in quite, quite thoroughly because I think they're a bit toxic on their own, they're a bit strong. Also some people say that they'll keep slugs off. Mm. I've never found that to be successful when I've tried it in pots and containers, but generally if I have any coffee grounds, I compost them so I don't mm. put them on direct. Uh, so yeah, when I have tried them in containers, it's never really kept any slugs and snails away for me. But um, if I do have any, they, they are only composted, but I don't have any other experience of using them. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> Anyone else or shall we move on to the next question? Because Liz has also said, um, my soil is quite dense and clay-like. I have made a bit of makeshift raised bed lined with stones and bricks in the absence of being able to buy wood for proper raised beds. I've incorporated some compost, which has made it a lot light, lighter, but I want to make sure I have success with what I grow. What vegetables are most suited to this soil type and will thrive? Also, what vegetables are best to be kept in pots? Few questions in there, so uh, yeah. Good vegetables for clay type soil that's attempted to be made a little bit lighter and uh, what would grow best in pots? Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> I'll have a quick go at that. Obviously in clay soil, you want something which is uh, 
shallow rooting because it's going to be hard to root deeply. So um, I don't know things like uh, I don't know beans or lettuce, things like that. But one of the classic things with vegan gardening is you set off with potatoes as part of your kind of crop rotation, which kind of breaks up the soil a bit. So uh, maybe think about that to begin with. Yeah. Piers, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say about growing things in, in pots. Of course, it, it depends partly on the size of the pots and, and a lot of plants will grow perfectly well in pots if they're fed and watered adequately. Um, but you might want to think along the lines of where these pots will be and of course they're they're movable so pots you can have near the kitchen door um, might be uh, growing the sort of plants that you want to pick frequently so certainly herbs obviously are a perfect um, plant for pots um, and also maybe things like lettuces, radishes, the sort of salad crops that grow quickly um, and that you'll want to pick frequently. They'll do very well in pots as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So we've got two questions left and only a few minutes. So we have to do some quick answers on these. But uh, the ninth question uh, is simply how, what's the fastest way to convert lawns to gardens? And how is this done the vegan organic way? So how do we convert a lawn into a garden? Who'd like to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, in terms of dealing with, with turf, it, it's a case of uh, using a, a, a spade to cut it into sections and then taking off uh, maybe about five centimetres of, of turf with, with the soil beneath. <laughs> and then if you're creating, for example, raised beds where you've taken the turf up, you can then turn the turf upside down, put it at the bottom of the raised beds, and that'll be that'll rot down nicely to create a nice loam. And then on top of that, you can put your compost and soil mixture to, to fill the bed. Perfect, thank you. Dan, do we have enough time for the last question? Dan, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we, hello? Can you hello. hear me? Yeah, hello. Very good. I think, so Dave, the, question, the last question actually came in today. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to put it onto our next show, um, if that's okay with everybody, because we are yeah. due to fit. We've got we've got we've got a clip to come on. We've got a really good clip to come on at the end of the show, so we've got to save a bit of time for that. And we're due to finish now, so I think yeah, I think we have to wrap up, guys. So I think thanks very much to the panelists. You've done a great job, and Ellen, you're a star. Mm -hmm. Don't I say more? <laughs> so. Yeah, thanks to the panellists, and um, like I said, we've got another little bit of the show to come on, but I'd just like to say to people, oh yeah, I did, uh, earlier on, I meant to mention the two books, so we've got Piers' book, which is The Vegan Cook and Gardener, uh, which he co-authored, oh, he's got one of himself, <laughs> <Can't see that. laughs> um, which he's co-authored with, um, with LRB, um, and there's Matthew's book, Matthew's book, there we go, um, The Super Organic Gardener, Everything You Need to Know About a Vegan Garden. So both those books and more books are available at the Vegan Organic Network bookshop, that's uh, veganorganic.net. Um, and we would appreciate feedback from the program, so if you've got any feedback, please send it, to, you can email us, you can either get the link off the website, veganorganic.net, or events at veganorganic.net. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be, we're gonna have another show in two weeks time. So if you get our newsletter or go into our Facebook or Instagram or one of these social media um, channels, uh, you'll be able to find out about when the next show is. So thanks everybody. I think we've actually on here, we've had 44 of atten uh, attendees and also we're streaming live on Facebook. So I'm sure there's thousands of people on Facebook. So thanks everybody for watching, but don't go away because we've got the highlight of the show. My son has been helping out with the show with all the technical things on Zoom, which I've been rubbish with, uh, but he's sorted all that out. And he's made some, he's done some filming and he's done, and he's done all sorts of things. And also uh, Mad Ideas, they did some great graphics for us. So thanks to them. Um, so yeah, for the, 
final of the show, if I can find out how to do it, it's sharing the screen. Uh, we've got Beacho, uh, no, yeah, yeah Beacho uh, Caesar. So here we go. I'll take it. I won't say any more because he'll say it all for himself. So here we go, guys. Thanks for watching. And here we go. Who any of you are? All right, hello, um, my name is Caesar, and um, I made this song in support of uh, Bond's veganic uh, gardening question time. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Peace. <laughs> Yo, I be bored under the money trees, kind of a rapper, but really only give a off about the flowers growing next to me. Letters to celery, lessons in letters, we're letting the veg grow. Sunstorms, hail blow, but still I'm here, digging up potatoes in my big old brown coat. It's locked down, so all these harvests come in handy, and it's healthy to be grafting on some ground that's really asking for tomatoes. I might smoke a Marlboro or sprout an avocado, it really takes its time so slow. Yo, it really takes its time so slow. Practice my patience or space in the Part the plants in the plot I'm raking all these leaves Which biodegrade into good, good soil Hey yo, soil where I choose to toil I don't support the walls for stolen oil Temper boils I don't support having poison Covering food and royals Richer than everyone else Or CEOs who never loyal To no one but the door yeah. To no one but the door So I'm sticking to my home Grown from sticky icky To chili, zucchini and spinach I never won't No You hear me? It's all about this allotment business You get me? Like 60 pounds for a whole year, man. And I'm like, I bring home these fat stacks of, 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 you know, kale and perpetual spinach and all that. Do you know what I mean? What do you know about organic food? You don't know nothing about that, man. And it, yo, honestly, bro, just try it, fam. Love it, you know what I mean? In support allotments bro, the allotment act in whatever year it was was a very important act in the UK history uh, Right up there with the Ramblers act, alright? 